My next guest is the op-ed columnist for The New York Times. I recently spoke to him about his struggles with a mysterious chronic illness and what it took to find a diagnosis and healing. He's written about the experience in a new book, The Deep Places, a memoir of illness and discovery. Here's my interview with Ross Douthat. <laughs> Ross, I want to start uh, with this harrowing tale you relate in the book. Uh, you become ill in the summer of 2015. You and your wife, Abby, are in the middle of selling your home in D.C. and moving to Connecticut, which seems like an idyllic uh, uh, destination where you wanted to be all along. Um, throughout all of this, you are horribly sick, and your doctors find what they diagnose as a boil. Uh, tell us what happened from there. So we were we were still in Washington. So we had bought our our dream house in the country in Connecticut, uh, but we were still living in you know the the corruptions of our nation's capital inside the Beltway for a few more months before we moved. And I became very very ill, and it started as you say with a red spot on my neck, but it quickly progressed to strange body pain, headaches, phantom heart attacks, bowel issues. Mm. Uh, I lost 40 pounds in two months. I was sleeping an hour a night. Um, it was incredibly bad. And none of the doctors in D.C. could figure out what was wrong with me. And so instead, what I... What did you, you know, think I was happening? I, I mean, I thought something was physically wrong with me. It was very clear to me most of the time mm -hmm. that I was in terrible pain. Um, and that it was real and not just something that was stress induced, which was sort of what the doctors, you know, when doctors can't figure out what mm -hmm. something actually is, they sort of retreat to mystery and say, well, you have a very important mm -hmm. job and you're under all kinds of stress. Probably you're generating <laughs> these symptoms somehow on your own. And I mostly didn't believe that. Um, but, you know, you when you see lots and lots of doctors and they all tell you the same thing, it sort of wears you down. And at certain points, I tried right. to tell myself, oh, this is all in your head and so on. Uh, interestingly, right. it was when I saw psychiatrists, they usually said, no, this is clearly a physical illness. <laughs> so it was only the, huh. the non-psychiatrists who said, oh, it's all in your head. Yeah, and at that point, you're already on antidepressants and Xanax and the whole thing. Um, how was it discovered that you had this chronic form of Lyme's disease? And what did you think when you found out that this was the source of your pain? So we finally made the move to Connecticut. We sort of dragged ourselves mm -hmm. to this to to this house that had been our dream house and now felt more like Stephen King territory because I was <laughs> so sick. And we were so isolated there. And once we got to the Northeast, you started seeing doctors who said, oh, we see weird illnesses like this all the time. The spot on your neck was probably a tick bite. You probably have Lyme disease. Wow. And they put me on antibiotics and I immediately stabilized. I stopped, you know, I, I started sleeping five hours a night instead of one hour. I was able to eat again, um, but the pain didn't go away. And so I quickly found myself inside this incredibly intense medical controversy because most most people who get Lyme disease take antibiotics and get better. 75, 80 percent right. of people just get better. But a large number don't. And there's this huge debate about whether doctors should go on treating them or whether there's nothing to be done. This is actually the official CDC view. There's nothing to be right. done and you just have to sort of wait and hope for to recover on your own. Yeah, and, and, and this is really, Lyme's disease has become a political minefield. I mean, as you mentioned, the CDC defines this as a disease caused by tick bites that can cause all sorts of problems. Um, it's usually treated in four to six weeks with antibiotics, and that's the end of it. But there is no official medical view on the chronic form of the disease. Uh, th this has all made you, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, deeply distrustful here of the CDC and those institutions that we turn to to medical answers. Why? Well, you, what you get a sense of is sort of how bureaucratic systems don't deal well with things that are outside their understanding. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what I've tried to do throughout this experience is maintain a certain kind of trust in the things that I think the medical system does well. I, I do think, you know, if I got diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, 
I would go in for chemotherapy. I, you know, antibiotics have been, you know, they're sort of a core, a core feature of modern science, and they've ended up being a core feature of my treatment. So I'm not trying to throw out the system, but the system is built yeah. around sort of easily testable and replicable results um, and diseases that are relatively easy to understand and easy to treat. And with chronic illness especially, and you see this now mm -hmm. with long-term COVID, um, you've seen it with chronic fatigue syndrome, Lyme disease is just one of many conditions that have this problem. You know, you get a diagnosis yeah. and the system is not built to treat you. It's not built to sort of mm -hmm. experiment with patients over a long period of time, which unfortunately is what you need to do to actually get better. Yeah. No, I, I have a number of friends, uh, two dear friends who have suffered through, they didn't know, like you, they weren't sure what they were going through, but it was pseudo paralysis. They couldn't walk. They, yep. they were having trouble holding food down. I mean, very odd symptoms. And uh, eventually they were diagnosed with Lyme's disease, but there's no clear medical answer here. Now, over the past six years or so, and I should point out, you are still ongoing in your recovery. You've tried what you've described as some very exotic treatments, including uh, <laughs> acupuncture, magnet therapy, and the Rife machine. Tell, explain to people, what is the Rife machine? How has it helped you? So the Rife, the, the Rife, the Rife machine is a box that generates various kinds of frequencies, audio, radio frequencies, different, different kinds of frequencies. And... The theory mm -hmm. behind it, which goes back to an American inventor in the 1940s, is that there are there is a frequency at which different bacteria, different pathogens, basically vibrate mm -hmm. and shatter, sort of the way, a, you know, an opera singer's high note can shatter right. um, a glass. Right. That's that's the theory. And so, you've had people who've basically seemingly conducted all kinds of off the books experiments with these with these frequencies and Lyme disease patients in particular have been likely to use them and end up swearing by them. Mm. But when you get the when you get the box, it comes with a booklet that lists frequencies for just about every every condition known to man. And so I, I wanna stress when I talk about this that I I don't have, you know, any kind of definitive scientific evidence that the Rife machine right. works. What I only have is personal mm -hmm. experience. Um, so if you go online and read about it, it does sound mm -hmm. like pseudoscience. Um, mm -hmm. But at a certain point when you've been sick for long enough, you end up trying a lot of things that you would never have considered trying before you got mm -hmm. sick. And not everything I tried worked, but very to my great surprise in certain ways the rife machine did clearly have effects similar to taking antibiotics which is just wow. a very i mean it's it's sort of comical in certain ways when you're doing these treatments on the edge on the fringes of science and you think of yourself as a very mm -hmm. serious and reasonable person right <laughs> and then they actually seem to work it's you know you can't help sort of laughing at the the unfathomable mysteries of the universe i guess Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, during this time, you're writing the book, COVID breaks out and you've since written pieces about the politics of this pandemic. What do you make of the way the pandemic's been handled by the CDC, by this administration, particularly in light of what you went through? I know you now describe yourself as COVID dovish. Uh, explain to people what that means and how this has shifted your thinking on all of this. Well, I mean, I think Part of it is just, you know, from the beginning, there was a view that, you know, you could just sort of trust the science, right? That that, that there, were, there was supposedly this absolutely certain science um, and we just all had to sort of accept it and, you know, mm -hmm. all, all would be well. And, you know, once you've gone through a chronic illness, you realize that, you you know, there's just a lot of time that you spend in territory where there isn't definitive science. And with a new disease right. like COVID, we were all in that territory for a certain period of time, right? So, you know, we couldn't get good tests at the beginning and the FDA botched the testing. And, you know, the, the WHO said one thing about how it was transmitted and then had to reverse itself. And the CDC, um, you know, people recommended against wearing masks and then they recommended wearing masks. And, you know, we still don't know for sure whether we were right to put so many patients on ventilators early on, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So there's and not all of this, I think the mistake some people make is thinking, well, 
you know, there's there's a there's an official conspiracy here where they're getting things wrong on purpose or something. That's that's not what's happening. It's just that even official medicine ends up sort of groping in the dark and yeah. it gets things right. Like we did get the vaccines in record time and that was a great achievement, but it also gets things wrong. And whether you're an individual person or patient or a policymaker, you know, you have to use your own reason and common sense while mm -hmm. looking at what official science is doing. And, you know, and then there's also the, I mean, there's, there's a weird, there is a lab leak hypothesis for Lyme disease, yep. <laughs> just as there is with, really? with COVID. So there's, there's a lot of strange stuff um, that wow. there are a lot, a chronic illness is very different from an illness like COVID in certain ways, but there are weird echoes and parallels between the two mm -hmm. that, I certainly noticed once we entered into the pandemic. In, in your book, the book we had you on the show once before for uh, to change the church, it was all about Pope Francis, the future of Catholicism. I'm interested in your take on the Vatican's vaccine mandate, Ross, given that the church has already supported individuals' rights of free conscience. Uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith has noted that vaccination is not as a rule a moral obligation and that therefore it must be voluntary, end quote. Yet they're imposing a vaccine mandate in Vatican City. I mean, I think the question of when to mandate vaccines is fundamentally a question of prudence, um, that there's no there's no definitive absolute moral answer. There are some situations where if the disease is dire enough and the consequences of people not being vaccinated are severe enough, you probably do need to mandate vaccines, but there are other cases where you want to err on the side of human liberty. I think in general, I'm really skeptical of vaccine mandates, you know, on sort of a large scale in the United States. The thing I might say in defense of the Vatican City vaccine mandate is that, you know, the Vatican has a uniquely elderly population <laughs> that may have particular risks. And so I would be, you know, I again, I think it's a prudential matter but I'd be more likely to support a vaccine mandate for Vatican City than I would be to support it for the United States, if that distinction uh, makes any sense. No, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, in deep places, you write about uh, how you were reluctant to take help from even your father, who helps you both financially to save your Connecticut home. You've since moved out, which after reading the book, I think is a <laughs> good choice. Uh, and he also helps with fixes and physical work. How difficult was it for you to accept his help? And what did you learn from that experience of not being able to do for yourself always? I mean, I think you learn a lot during a chronic illness of how fundamentally dependent we are. And, you know, one of the themes of this book is, you know, I got sick at age 35 after having spent 15 years as an adult sort of being generally very successful. I became a New York Times columnist at a young age. I married the woman I wanted to marry. We had then two beautiful children. Now we have four. And I sort of thought of life, you know, at an intellectual level. I thought, you know, well, of course, bad things happen and suffering is an important part of life. And I was very critical of, you know, sort of shallow theologies that say, oh, God just wants you to be happy and, you know, do what God wants and good things will happen. I was critical right. of those intellectually, but I sort of believed them for myself. I sort of felt like if I just, you know, mm. made the right choices, my life would be a pretty smooth walk and I would be sort of an independent and masterful person, that I was you know, going to have this family compound in rural Connecticut and live there happily. Right. And disease is, a, is an educator in the reality that, right. you know, yeah, I, was, I became dependent on family members. We relied heavily on my father for help and support. I was dependent on my wife, who suffered mightily through this experience. Right. And then more generally, you're just, you know, you're in the hands of God. And when you have an experience mm -hmm. like this, it's not always totally reassuring, right? You know, the fear of the Lord yeah. is the beginning no, of scary. wisdom, right? You sort of, you, you, mm -hmm. I, so I would say that my belief in God was strengthened by this, but so was also my sense that, you know, God does not always deliver you exactly what you expect. And some of the things that he delivers are, you know, incredible trials and tests that you have to undergo and survive. 
Yeah. No. Well, you you write at one point running into a monk, uh, you know, at an airport, and you tell him about your suffering, and he says, "Quote. We'll end with this. It's a gift. It's not something just to wish away or run from. It's there for purgation, refinement, redirection. If you've wandered onto the wrong path, and if you're on the right path, doing important work, well, then you should expect to get some demonic attacks from time to time." That kind of sums it up. When I read that, I thought, "Wow, this is this I can relate to." Ross, hey, he was a he was a serious monk, and yeah, I mean, what I what I found, the book, you know, when when you're really sick, you pray for God to just sort of simply and cleanly take the suffering away. And I have gotten mm -hmm. better. I've gotten a lot better. But the moments along the journey in in the book and and elsewhere that I had that felt like sort of you know, moments of some kind of contact with the divine weren't moments of healing. They were more sort of, you know, sometimes it was almost God winking at you and saying, yeah, I'm here <laughs> and you have to go yeah. through this thing and I'm asking you to go through this thing and I'm reminding you that I'm with you, but it doesn't mean I'm going to immediately take your suffering away. And that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that that was how I experienced um God's presence to the extent that I did during this as a sort of forms of sort of reassurance that didn't that weren't actually, you know, weren't actually an instant, some sort of instant and miraculous cure, which obviously very, very few people receive, which is why we call them miracles. Mm. No, well, it's a, it's a lyrical, beautiful book, terrifying at moments, but sooner or later, Ross, as I read it, I thought we're all going to be here uh, in some form or other, and you're wrestling with uh, the eternal things, the things that, uh, whether they're correctives or not, they're never pleasant to go through, but they're here for a reason. They're part of our human experience and our brush with God, I think. So uh, thank you for writing it, uh, Deep Places. It was a powerful read. I hope everybody grabs a copy. Thank you, Raymond. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. The Deep Place is a memoir of illness and discovery by Ross Douthat. is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank <laughs> you.